The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Did you guys hear the news? What? What, what news? news? Uh, no. Come and go convenience stores are no more. I did hear oh, that. Yes. Really? I'm really sad yes. about it. It was bought by a company out of Utah, and come and go convenience stores are no more. I did hear oh, that. Yes. Really? I'm really sad yes. about it. It was bought by a company out of Utah, and I guess they decided that the name was not appropriate. <laughs> For, for that's not you, that surprising. I actually. would admit that when I first moved to Iowa City 20 years ago, that was among the first things that I was like, okay, that's a that's an odd choice. Mm -hmm. See, growing up in Iowa, yeah. that just it never even crossed my mind. Like yeah. until other people in college were like, "What did you? What just is say? this place?" And I was like, "Wait, you don't have those? Like, <laughs> it's, it's a special part of Iowa. It's going to be called Maverick now. Uh, uh, Maverick." That's not very fun. I don't like yeah. it. Yeah. It's not as catchy. I don't like change. Well, I don't, you know. It <laughs> doesn't really sound convenience store. No. no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know. We, we'll, maybe we should write in with some names that will be an alternative. I think that's a valid. But it's sad in a way. Yeah. Piece of Iowa. Dates yeah. back to the 60s, that name. So. Wow. Oh, well. None of our listeners care. No. about this <laughs> at all meandering in the margins of medicine it's the short coat podcast weird news fresh views helpful clues and interviews by students for students subscribe to our weekly show at the shortcoat.com Welcome back to the Short Code Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose. It's a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler. It's finally 2024. Happy New Year to you all. Happy New Year to you thank, as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And with me today in the SCP studio, she doesn't care what you think. It's M1 Alan, Alex Nig. Hi. <laughs> and she's keeping her name even, it do, even if it does remind you of something unsavory. It's M2 Madeline Ungs. Hello. I'm not sure what it reminds. It doesn't remind me of anything. It's just I just had okay. to. I, just I, had I to was say wondering that. what that meant. No, <laughs> no. Ungs. I think it's a fun name. It is. It's fun to say. I like it. But that's not all short coats. We've got a special guest with us today. Dr. Brittany Bettendorf is a clinical assistant professor in rheumatology with an interest in medical humanities, which is nice for, for me. She co-directs our humanities distinction track for medical students with my colleague, Katie Prisky. And she's on the faculty of CECOM's Biomedical Ethics and Humanities Department. But today, she's all about her sleeper specialty, medicine pediatrics. Welcome to the short code, Dr. Bettendorf. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah. So my one of the co-hosts, AJ, put, helped me put together this list of sleeper specialties. These are specialties that we think people should know more about, maybe going a little bit beyond the, the more well-known ones. So can you explain what MedPeds is? And how it sure, differs, yeah. and, and maybe a little bit about how it differs from other, I mean, it's a primary care specialty. And so how it differs from other things like pediatrics or internal medicine. Sure. And I was so curious why it was a sleeper specialty. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, you explained I, that. You know, me. I bet he so, told me, I bet he told me why he thought it was a sleeper specialty, but it's been weeks. And <laughs> I was going to say, we don't have anything to do with sleep. MedPeds is a specialty that combines internal medicine and pediatrics into one residency program. So by the end of completing your residency program, you're eligible to become board certified in both internal medicine and pediatrics. You're also eligible to pursue subspecialty in any of the internal medicine subspecialties or any of the pediatric subspecialties, which is very nice. And it leaves the door open for a lot of other opportunities as well. What it entails is completing the full internal medicine residency program and the full pediatric residency program, but they shorten it up a little bit because that would be a very long residency. So in four years, you complete the equivalent of two years of internal med and two years of pediatrics. The time at like the, the frequency of which you switch back and forth can be program dependent. The particular program that I graduated from, every four months we rotated. So mm. we would spend 
four months on internal med, then four months on pediatrics, then four months on internal med, four months on pediatrics, and you just kept rotating back and forth that way. It is different from family medicine, for example, because we do spend, I think, more time probably in the ICU. So we spend time in the neonatal intensive care unit, in the pediatric intensive care unit. We spend time in the neuro intensive care unit, time in the cardiac intensive care unit, time in the regular adult intensive care unit, the medical ICU. And, but we do not spend any time in OB, so which appealed to me because I had a very hard time on my OB rotation with all of the different aspects of that. So I was like, okay, I'm ready. I'm fascinated by OB and I love taking care of pregnant patients, but I do not want to deliver babies. And so they do not do that in med ped specialty, which is different than some family medicine residencies where that's a, a major part of it. And it's different than internal medicine by itself or pediatric by itself because we cover the whole gamut. So we might you know, spend time in the newborn nursery one month and the next month we're on geriatrics or palliative medicine. And so we do see the whole gamut of the lifespan from day one of being alive all the way through maybe end of life care or in geriatric care. So you're further specialized as a rheumatologist, I think, right? Correct. How does that work? You did a fellowship? Yes. So I did an adult fellowship in rheumatology. And that was the decision I made after going through med peds. I was very, very interested in transition of care of pediatric patients that had rheumatologic problems into adult rheumatology because pedi- rheumatologic problems really are often lifelong problems. So if they acquire one of those or develop one of those in their pediatric years, um, most patients will continue to have that medical um, issue throughout life. And transition from Um, their pediatric rheumatologist who may have known them since they were two or three years old um, to an adult rheumatologist can be very jarring. And it's a time where sometimes their disease becomes less well controlled, where patients maybe are learning how to have autonomy over their condition for the first time in their life. And sometimes where the transition doesn't happen and patients are lost to follow up of something that really needs follow up. And so I was very intrigued by the idea of becoming this sort of transition specialist. I also really enjoy taking care of pregnant patients, even though I don't like OB because of the delivering babies aspect of that. But I love taking care of pregnant patients in rheumatology and with rheumatologic problems. And so my MedPeds background did help me a lot there with that particular young adult age group that tends to be the ones that are having babies. And so I really love counseling patients when they're interested in talking about becoming pregnant and they have a rheumatologic disease, the safety of that for them, what does this mean for them and their condition, looking at medication options that are going to be safe and compatible with pregnancy for them, and then following them throughout that whole pregnancy. So my MedPeds background helped me with both of those goals. And then I decided to do a specific adult rheumatology residency with a lot of pediatric electives Mm. so that I could be trained to take care of that um, particular patient population. Do you feel like a lot of people who go the MedPeds route end up doing something similar with like the transition age group and trying to hone in on you know not having patients be lost to follow up or some of those situations where you might have a complicated condition and need kind of that continuity between peds to adult medicine Absolutely. I think in my particular, you know, residency year, we did, I did come from a class where a lot of people did go into fields where they were interested in transitioning patients. One really popular route, at least where I trained for med peds physicians to go into was adult congenital cardiology, which I actually started out interested in. And then the more I got into that, I realized like, I don't um, thrive under the intensity that is cardiology. And so like, this isn't for me. And then I found rheumatology and I absolutely loved it. So I, I sort of changed courses, but that is something that particularly lends itself to a MedPeds focus because when babies are born with congenital heart defects, they'll oftentimes need to undergo heart surgery and that completely changes their cardiac anatomy into something that is workable and very effective. And and now patients that have had congenital cardiac surgery are living a very long time and they're then needing an adult cardiologist that can help handle adult cardiology problems like plaque in the coronary arteries, but in a heart that doesn't look or act like a normal adult heart because of its um, different anatomy that was surgerized when they were very little. So that's where you come into you know, like a field like med peds where we are situated to care for those types of patients because we have taken care of both the pediatric patients that have these heart defects and very familiar with the surgery and what that looks like and what their new anatomy is, but also familiar with how to take care of those adult problems. So that's kind of one example of where med peds as a specialty can be, be very helpful. Um, a lot of med peds people stay in primary care. Um, and so um, 
they end up very well equipped and very well trained to handle all different kinds of acuity across the whole realm of ages. Um, and then some med peds people will do hospital medicine and they'll, you know, maybe rotate as a hospitalist on adult medicine one week and pediatric medicine the next week. And what I find that's really cool about med peds and what motivated me to actually go into med peds was that when I was a medical student, I rotated with a resident who was just terrific in every way. She was an amazing communicator, a very kind and patient human, really wonderful with her patients and so, so knowledgeable and competent. And she was med peds. And it really triggered for me that this is a specialty where pediatrics, we emphasize, you know, family centered rounds, communication, working with the whole family and like that shared decision making model. And then a lot of times in general pediatrics, patients might be on zero medications or one medication or they have no chronic health problems at all. Right. But then on the flip side, we go to adult medicine and people have a medication list that's three pages long and they have a problem list list with 10 or 15 things on it. And, and all of a sudden there's such complexity there. But sometimes the communication, the working with patients and families families, that aspect of the training can sometimes get de-emphasized. And so with MedPeds training, I think you get the best of both worlds. You get very comfortable with complexity. You get very comfortable with communication and handling the nuances of working with patients and families and dynamics that can occur. And so sometimes MedPeds folks that are in primary care can be very well equipped to work with people with special needs as well. And that is something that I also do in my practice in adult rheumatology as well. I'll work with people that have special needs and maybe their parent is still their guardian or they have a guardian of the state, or um, there's something that they need that is extra special that my pediatrics training can kind of kick in and help me with. And I value that every day in my practice. That's super interesting. I had never really thought about the kind of communication aspect of it and how the training between peds and internal medicine would work and how, you know, the approaches could be slightly different, but how when combined together, I mean, that's going to benefit on all sides, regardless of what specifically you end up going into. But yeah, that's very cool. It's interesting that you said that because I remember like when I would be on my pediatric rotation, people were so, people are so gentle with kids in a way that we should really be gentle with everybody, right? And so I, on my pediatrics rotation, we would be so thoughtful about what blood draws we're ordering, as we always should be, right? But kids are small and we don't want to take out 10 vials of blood and that's too much blood to draw. So we were very thoughtful about how frequent we needed to order labs, which lab tests we really needed. And if they got poked that morning and there's somebody else that wants a test later that day, we might think, do I really need this test right now? Or can I group it with their morning labs and spare that patient a second poke today and make this hospitalization for them a little bit less you know, painful? And so in the adult world, that's not really something people would think about. You would just order your routine labs, you'd get every lab that you would want to get, and you didn't think about the amount of blood that you're taking out of this patient, right? Or if somebody comes by later and the, you know, the, the specialist comes by later and they say, I want this particular lab test, you just stick it right in and they get poked the next another time that day, right? And people don't think about it. But when you have that pediatric mindset coming in, I think that that does carry into the adult world and you realize like, oh, they've already been poked this morning this test probably isn't urgent for them to get back today. It's not going to prolong their stay. It's not going to change the management in the next couple hours. Maybe that could be on their you know, 7 a.m. labs tomorrow and not have to be something that they go through again later today. So I think there's some lessons from pediatrics that maybe we all benefit from in the adult world as well, which is the way that we think about the care and the, the gentleness towards our patients. Was that something that you learned during training or is that something you picked up over over time? That was something especially learned during inpatient training, because we really think about the volume of blood that we're drawing, especially on small individuals. And in the adult world, that's not something that I will say that we routinely think about. And we also don't think about the comfort and the discomfort of that experience of being in the hospital with having your blood drawn multiple times in one day. And there are situations where like you absolutely have to do that. For example, someone's having a heart attack and you're trending their troponins or you're worried they have a GI bleed and you've got to get serial hemoglobins. Like, absolutely, that's appropriate. But I'm talking about the kind of test where someone comes by later in the day and they say, oh, yeah, we probably should get a TB quantifier on this patient because we're probably going to start immunosuppression in a couple of days. Let's get that. It's like, OK, then all of a sudden they've got to get poked for that blood test that they don't really need in that moment. And it could wait for the next morning. And so I think 
with the pediatrics training, it makes you think about those things in a little bit more careful of a way. And a little bit more, I think, attention also with pediatrics to patients' pain, patients' comfort, patients' privacy, communication with families. And these are all things that carry over into the adult world and are really valuable in the adult world, but maybe aren't as emphasized in adult training. And so that was one thing I really appreciated about having the two different perspectives from peds and adults. Yeah. Can you share any specific success stories or case studies involving MedPeds care? What is that? What is there? Is there anything you can tell us about what that looks like exactly? Sure. When I started here, I had a patient come in for a new consult that was a young adult. She had some developmental delay. She came in with her mother and I was asked to consult on if she had a rheumatologic problem. And the more history that I got from her and her mother, the more that I realized this didn't sound like a classic rheumatologic problem in a young adult, but it actually sounded more like a childhood issue that wasn't in my field. And so I was like, I, I think that you have something else going on. And so I sent her to one of my colleagues who is an immunologist, which is a different specialty, that's allergy immunology. And turns out she had an immunodeficiency in her childhood that was leading to frequent fevers, frequent infections. It was getting sort of labeled as fever of unknown origin over the years, but it wasn't really of unknown origin. It was different infections and it hadn't really been picked up on. And so I think that was helpful in that situation to have that perspective of like, yeah, this doesn't sound like a classic young adult issue. This sounds like an issue going back into childhood that is different from what I'm an expert in and I need some help here. And so that was, you know, I think one example is that sometimes it helps me recognize when something doesn't fit the bill of like what childhood maybe should have looked like for that person if this was something that she was having now as a young adult. Instead, it was something that had more chronicity and delving back in time had helped with the history taking. So that does come in handy. The other thing that comes in handy, I think it just broadens our differential and our perspective in a lot of ways when we have that background of both pediatric pathologies and adult pathologies. And it also even makes me think differently about preventative care and preventative medicine. I was taking care of a patient that had a rheumatologic condition but on top of that rheumatologic condition, there were other things that just weren't quite fitting the bill. Like he would get infections frequently. He would get fevers frequently, different, kind of similar sounding to my other lady. But but I was like, I don't really have a good explanation for this. But delving into his chart, he'd had a splenectomy and had never had proper vaccination for somebody who'd had a splenectomy. So he was getting affected by infections that that could have been prevented had he, his immunizations been updated at the time of the splenectomy. And so I think sometimes with MedPeds, we're focused nicely on preventative medication or preventative medicine and things that we can do to keep people healthy as well. And that comes from our PEDS background because you learn the whole childhood vaccination schedule and every visit, oh, multiple sure. visit, you're like, what vaccines do I need to update? And so I think it just broadens your perspective on those types of things. Too. The people who go into internal medicine strike me as people who really like getting into these complicated situations and these, you know, these situations where you have to sort of delve into the mystery of it. Is that, you, you think that's right? I think that's very fair. That's actually one of the things that drew me to rheumatology. When I was in residency and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to be an adult congenital cardiologist all along. And then I had submitted a rotation request and it was full. And so I got placed in rheumatology instead. And I was like, rheumatology, what is this thing? And then I loved it. And so it actually ended up being the best thing that ever could have happened to me because it's what I ended up deciding to go into. And it was just wonderful. But what I loved about it, Dave, was exactly what you said, is that rheumatologists have to be really good internists to be a rheumatologist because there's so much that we get consulted on that is not rheumatology, but it's just that people don't know what it is. And so then we have to put the pieces of the puzzle together and realize like, who are the other parties that need to be involved in the patient's care? What can we rule in? What can we rule out? What's the differential? And we get to really try to take you know, sort of a nebulous puzzle and maybe missing pieces and try to find those pieces and put them together and see what the end picture is. And that's when I have the most fun is, is when I can sit there and sort of ruminate, right, on what could this possibly be. And it's really fun to be that sort of diagnostician. And you have to have a good, you know, strong internal medicine background to be able to do that because that's such um, a part of what rheumatology is and such a part of what internal medicine is as well. And when you're able to expand the puzzle pieces available to you with pediatric background too, I think that also helps to just sort of think outside the box too in, in cases where things are very complex. Yeah. How do you like to get, moving from med peds to the education side? How do you like to work with students? You know, when you have a you know, 
when you have a student who is maybe rotating with you or, you know, working with you, what do you like to see from them and what do you like about um, working with them? Sure. So what I love working with students about is their the fresh eyes that they bring to patient care. So a lot of times students bring excitement to patient care and I think deep care for their patients because students will usually, you know, they're learning and that's they're there to learn. And so they'll usually have a little less patients that they're following, particularly like on the inpatient side, for example. So they get to know the patients. And so that's really what I appreciate and enjoy working with the, the students so much is that enthusiasm that they bring and that deep care that they bring for the patients that they're taking care of. And then what I hope to kind of teach them from the MedPeds perspective is the communication aspect of things that I hope doesn't get overlooked. And I, I think it's so important to who we are as clinicians to um, be able to communicate well with our with our patients and to be able to share parts of both who we are as people so that they'll hopefully open up and trust us and have a better relationship um, of care as well. Um, so when I have students working with me, I hope that's what they'll take away from the rotation. Um, and no matter what they go into, I think the approach to care um, can be helpful no matter what you someday you know, someday experience or someday choose to go into. Even if you go into surgery or pathology, if you go into the approach to taking care of a patient with deep care and kindness and um, appreciation for your colleagues, I think that's something that transitions across all specialties. And so I hope that's something that students take away from being with us in MedPeds. I hope I answered your question. I think I got off topic. No, I think you did all right. <laughs> Well, you made it to this break. You tolerate us. If you can, consider donating or buying a sticker or something. Visit theshortcoat.com and help us do stuff without having to beg a dean for money. Thanks. I think we were talking before the show about the fact that Madeline has just finished Transitions Week. And so she's about to head off into clinic. And we were talking about the thing that happens between med students and attendings and residents where they get they're being recruited to whoever they're talking to specialty if especially if they're you know really good medical students and you know there, there's two ways that people that students typically go about responding to this recruitment one is to say you know yes absolutely i want to go into your field even if it's not what they want to go into and then th there's the other one which is to be more honest and to say no I it's not the field for me, but I'm really interested in being here to learn what I can learn that I can take into my specialty in the future, which is kind of one of the things I want people to know about. I, I feel like it's much more honest to to do it the second way than to pretend so that like, I'm not really sure why people pretend. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that will really help you with if you're lying I don't know. I've heard not to do I don't that. Think, uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't think they see it. I don't, I don't think it's seen as a lie so much as like, well, I just want to, you know, like, I don't know what to say in this situation. So I'm going to, you know, pretend I'm going to take the easy way out. Yeah, we'll pretend to know exactly what we want. to. Yeah, do. sure. I'll come to your party. Probably kind of like trying to tell them like <laughs> what you think they want to hear, too, yeah, yeah. like. I mean, that's just a part of like being a human is you yeah. want to you, you do want to do that, I guess, a lot of times. But in We're this people pleasers, I guess, you know, no matter what students end up going into, I think there's something that we learn from every single person we work with and hopefully good, positive things that we want to emulate and that we see as, you know, role modeling certain behaviors or the, the approach to care. And then there's also the negative role models, too. I mean, I hate to say that, but that happens. Like, sure. I, I like to teach people how provided. not to be. <laughs> yeah, you know, like you see care for and you're like, I am never going to do that. Yeah. Right. And, and so no matter, you know, no matter if you go into this specialty or not, I think there's something important to be learned all the time. And no matter who you are in that specialty, there's something to be learned from the people around you. So I think as an attending physician, I need to keep an open mind and realize that like every single person on my team has something important to offer. And I'm going to learn something from the medical student. I'm going to learn something from the resident. I'm going to learn something from the fellow. And I hope I can teach something to all those folks as well. 
And that's really what makes an effective team in medicine as well. And I hope students come into the rotation with an open mind in case they do end up liking it, right? Like, um, like what happened with you. And, right, exactly. So I went into the rheumatology rotation thinking, what the heck is this? And then I ended up absolutely loving it. And like I was working with Dr. Ryan, who has since retired, but just this wonderful doctor that would go into the room with his traditional black bag. Like he was known <laughs> for carrying his black bag throughout the hospital. And like it was like a Mary Poppins bag, like whatever he needed he could pull out of that bag you're like how did that fit in that bag but it was just amazing like i mean he could walk into the room spend five to ten minutes with the patient and you felt like you were in there for an hour just because he showed such care and such kindness and compassion to the patient and he just had this way about him that felt like no matter how much time he spent it was the right amount of time. Like it was just beautiful. And that takes like a whole lot of skill and finesse and art. That's truly the art of medicine, right? Like making that encounter feel complete, even if it's not a long encounter, right? And making the patient really feel like they were valued and heard is a skill. And so whether or not I had gone into rheumatology, like he was someone that I was going to learn from no matter what, right? And I, I loved it so much, I decided to go into it. But I guess the point being with students is like, I don't think you have to say you want to go into something you don't want to go into, right? Like, don't come to my party if you don't want to come to my party. But be interested in hearing about my party. And <laughs> hopefully I can convince you to come. But nobody wants the student that, to say like, oh, yeah, I really want to go into your specialty when they don't mean it. But what we love is when the students are eager and excited to learn about something they've never gotten to um, learn about before. And maybe just maybe they'll really like it and then we can convince them. You know, but This kind of went back to an earlier thing, I think. But I'm just curious, since I'm starting rotation soon, when you felt like the med peds thing really came together, you know, you have your internal medicine rotation, you have your pediatric pediatrics rotation. And did it feel very like separate for a while? I guess. And then my question is, when did you feel like you could really bring those together? Was that residency or was that not until... Uh, you were in attending? Well, that's such a great question. So I just dis- discovered what med, pe- I never knew what med peds was as a student. So like the fact that you already know what it is, even if we're a sleeper specialty, <laughs> the fact that you like know it exists is awesome because I didn't really know, you know, what it was until later on, after, like when I was pretty far into my clinical rotations. So what happened was I, I thought that I wanted to go into neurology. That was like very far back. Like I had majored in neuroscience and poetry and undergrad. And I was like, I'm going to go into neurology. I love the brain. The brain is so cool. So you can see a, a transition here, how like I went neurology, then like adult congenital cardiology, <laughs> and then I ended up doing something totally different. But, and point being is that like, when you tell people that you don't want to come to the party, you might end up actually wanting to come to the party. So because <laughs> so of the mind, your minds change and you learn more about the specialty and realize things evolve. But anyway, I thought I wanted to go into neurology. So when I was like picking my third year schedule, I had, I think pediatrics as one of my first rotations. And I had said, you know, I was interested in neurology. So I got put on pediatric neurology and that was horrible. No offense to all the pediatric neurologists <laughs> out there, but like it was, I just found it like a really sad specialty where you're seeing a lot of like really sick people and there's not always a lot of things to offer. And I was just like, I couldn't do this. Like, this is so hard. And here was the thing I really thought I was going to do with my life. And I realized like, I could never do this. It's just not me. It wasn't who I was or what I wanted to do. But what came out of that rotation was I met Rachel Johnson, who was the med peds resident that I was talking about mm-hmm. that made me want to go into med peds because she was just she was my resident when, at the time when I was a student and I was like, I want to be her. Like, how can I be her? She's so cool. She's like so smart and competent and so great with her patients. And so then I started talking to her about med peds, which I'd never heard of and realized like, this is what I want to do. And that was so cool. And the program where I trained at, or actually the med school where I went had a very good med peds residency program. And so I got exposed to a number of med peds residents when I was on my clerkships. And so this thing that I had never heard of all of a sudden became something where I got to talk to different residents that were doing it and learn about it. But I still didn't really have, you know, a a good sense of like, how do you integrate medicine and pediatrics together? And that's where I thought, okay, well, maybe I'll go into adult congenital cardiology then. And this is like a great field to have a background in both adult and peds. And then as I kind of went through that, I realized that wasn't me either, but but med peds was me. And it's very interesting being a med peds resident and realizing that early on in your training, you never feel, at least for me, I don't know, maybe other people are more competent than me, but I never felt competent like my whole first and second year of residency because you're transitioning back and forth so much. And so I was, I think, hopefully more competent than I felt that I was, but, but it was, I never really felt comfortable because 
I, you would have four months on pediatrics. And just by the end of the four months, you're like, oh, I'm starting to feel like I sort of know pediatrics. It was time to rotate to adult. And then you get onto adult and all of your colleagues that are the in the internal medicine track have already been doing it for the four months that you were on peds. And it's your first month on internal med and they've been doing it for four months. So they know what they're doing. And you're like, what am I doing? You're a big person and not a baby. And like, this is all very different. And then you have four months of that and you sort of figure it out and you're like, okay, I sort of feel good now. And then you switch back to pediatrics <laughs> and you're like, oh my gosh, what am I doing all over again? And so it's really jarring those for that, especially that first year. But by the end of your second year, you start to realize like, I know so much more than I ever thought I would know. And like, it's really cool. And it kind of all comes together and you realize like, uh, that one specialty is lending you in like important and good skills that maybe you wouldn't have gotten from the other specialty. And so that's when all of a sudden you start to realize like there's a lot of crosstalk here and that your new perspective does have a lot of benefit. But it really did, at least for me, it took me like those first two years out of the four year residency to really feel like I could handle those transitions and that it was okay. And even towards the latter part of residency, that first or second day onto the other side, like after you switched from medicine to pediatrics was always a little jarring, but it only took like one or two days to get going and running again, as opposed to like the four months where I'm like, oh, I'm starting to feel finally like I can do this and then I gotta switch. Um, but I think that's normal. And I know like from going through the residency program that some of my, you know, my colleagues felt that way too. And the cool part is that it's like baby steps, right? Like you don't always see the progress you're making, but then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, I made so much progress when you look back over the years. But I think it does take most of residency to, to feel good about it. Trusting the process. Trust the process. Yeah. Yes. And just like the rest of medical school, right? You trust the process and it will get you where you need to go. Because medical students are so trusting. They always trust the process. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Don't really have a choice. So much trust. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are always trying to figure out the system. You guys are always trying to figure it out. So to clarify, so during your residency, you were, I guess I didn't think about the fact that you would be working with people who were solely doing internal medicine or like also solely doing pediatrics. Yeah. So those are called categoricals in our terms, at least. So they have the categorical pediatric residents that are just doing pediatrics. You have the categorical IM residents that are just doing IM. And then you have the med peds. And we're, at least where I trained, and this is different everywhere, we were a tiny little group. So I had six people in my med peds residency class. It's a four-year program. So there were 24 of us in that program. Now, in each year of internal med, I'm going to misquote numbers because this was a long time ago, but there were at least 30 categoricals per year. So they had more in one year of internal med than we did in all of our four years of pediatrics in terms of manpower. So on a typical rotation, I was usually with a team that was all categoricals, maybe a handful of my rotations, I got to work with one of my little cohort of med peds, but that was rare. So most of the time you're with the categorical IM or categorical peds residents. And just like any specialty, I think internal med and pediatrics both have their own culture and med peds is its own subculture within those cultures. And so oftentimes like pediatric residents, they have this culture of sort of being very caring and nurturing and like, They'll talk to you forever about how can they, you know, make the patient comfortable or what what does this patient really need? And the internal medicine residents like, I'm going to give you a two second sign out and I'm moving on to the next patient on the list. Here you go. And so like you get used to both cultures. And but it is shocking because you'll go from like this really long sign out that's like, and if the mom comes, she needs this kind of reassurance. And if the patient has pain, they have these four different pain medicines. And if this happens, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that might be like the pediatric sign out. And then you get to the adult person and they're like, yeah, this person's here for like a rule out of a heart attack. We're trending to opponents next patient. You know, <laughs> like, okay. So it's just very, di I'm of course making things, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm being silly, but, but you know, it, it's different culture on the two different things. And med peds, you sort of have to walk those that line mm -hmm. between those two different cultures and it becomes a culture in and of itself that's really interesting did so going back to kind of the residency application process did you feel like since these programs are so much smaller like did you feel limited at all when applying to those programs or did you have second thoughts of hmm, maybe i should just choose one or the other? Or how did you kind of go about that process? 
That's a great question. I think there is a medpeds personality, just like there's a personality for everything. I think the medpeds personality is the crazy person that wants to do it all. (laughs) And so like literally the person that doesn't say no to anything. And that was me. Like if you were like, yeah, do you want to collaborate on this project? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I have eight other projects, but yeah, let's add me on that one. (laughs) And like, you don't want to say no to any opportunity because you're excited about everything. And so that I think really is the culture of medpeds is the person that loves everything, is super excited about everything, doesn't want to miss an opportunity because every opportunity brings a learning experience. And so I guess going through that process of applying to residency, I felt that in the MedPeds culture and I had worked with enough MedPeds residents to know like this is who I am and like these people are my people. And I do think that helps when you're deciding on a specialty is like when you find the specialty where it's your people, like that there's something to be said for that. And when I was going through rotations as a medical student, I liked everything except OB. I didn't like OB, (laughs) which is ironic because I do like maternal counseling now but but I did not like the idea of like delivering a baby and if something went wrong that was on me and I was just like I can't handle this but I did but I liked everything I didn't like surgery either and I don't med peds you do no surgery so I was like I can rule those two things out but short of ruling those two things out I really did like everything and I liked all ages I liked working with babies I still love babies I have two of my own now so that's enough but but yeah so, <laughs> um, but I liked working with babies and then I also really love working with el- the elderly population I think we have so much to learn from them. And so it just, I was like, I couldn't say no to to like, if I chose, for example, just internal med, I would have really missed working with kids. And if I said yes to just pediatrics, I would have really missed working with the adult population and the geriatric population. And so that's where I, I really landed on med peds as a specialty. I elected not to do family medicine because I didn't want to have like surgical aspects of it or obstetric aspects of it. And I also had worked with enough med peds residents that I felt like this was sort of the culture that I wanted to be in. And I also thought that I might subspecialize as well. So So those were kind of all the different things that sort of came together with why I went into it. Did it restrict me in applications? Yes, I think there's there are less med there are definitely less med peds programs in the country than there are internal med programs or peds programs. Sure, we don't have one here, right? (laughs) Yeah, right. We don't don't have one here. That's why it's Um, a sleeper specialty. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, so there's less programs in the country for med peds. So maybe if you had a very specific like geographic place you wanted to be, it could be restrictive. I wanted to be in the Midwest. I applied mostly in the Midwest and then a couple programs out east. There aren't that many med peds programs in the West, um, at least when I applied. Maybe that has changed since. And I, I'm sorry if I'm out of date. But so there might be some like geographic restrictions. For me, it didn't matter because there were enough in the area I wanted to stay and that I had options. I only applied med peds. I didn't apply peds or IM categorical because I knew it wasn't what I wanted. And sometimes I think people get different advice about that or whatever. But the advice I got was if that's what you want to do, then just apply to that. So I applied to a lot of med peds programs and was very happy. I matched at Medical College of Wisconsin, which is where I did all my training. I was a lifer there. And uh, I wanted to stay there because I love their program. And I still think that they have probably the best med peds program in the country, in my unbiased opinion. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I have a very biased opinion, but um, but I think it was a great place to train. And um, by the time I got done training there, I felt so good about the care that, that I could provide at the time. I think, you know, feeling good about wherever you go and whatever you go into is huge because it's what you're going to spend, you know, your working life doing. So. I hope I answered your question, didn't get too derailed. No, yeah, you definitely did. It's interesting to hear kind of as a first year medical student who hasn't gone through any of that process yet. And I think it's since it is everybody decides to go their own route by the time fourth year comes around. It is just interesting since MedPeds is a bit smaller, like you may not have other people who are trying to, you know, go into that sort of thing, especially if it's not as well-known around here. So yeah, just interesting food for thought. Yeah, I wish we had a program here because I think by not having a program, even though students can learn about it and things like, you know, what's it like doing Elway rotations at other institutions Mm -hmm. that have it or things like this podcast, or they can read about it on websites. It's different than working day in and day out with somebody who is a MedPeds resident. Mm -hmm. Because that's how I got interested was working with a MedPeds resident and realizing like, she just knew her stuff so dang well. And I was like, I want to be you and like be as competent as you. And, and just like the way that she approached care was the whole philosophy that I wanted to have someday. And so, so that was life changing. And I think a lot of times we, 
pick specialties because of different role models that we meet along the way. Yes. And so a lot of it is very situational who we're fortunate enough to get the chance to work with, right? So by not having a MedPeds program, I, I think it's hard because how do you pick a specialty when you didn't really get to work with a resident mm-hmm. that is in that specialty? So I, I think that's a real challenge for you guys. And I applaud you for like exploring a specialty that that we don't have here. And I, I wish we did. And maybe someday we will. So <laughs> I hope. I think I sense a future residency program director at Iowa. (laughs) Brittany. You know, I would be so excited if MedPeeps was able to come to Iowa. (laughs) You like taking on new projects, I hear. (laughs) I can't say no to it. I don't say no to anything. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. Short Coats, if this episode is worth listening to this far, it's worth sharing. So blast us on your socials. And if you want a sticker for your trouble, send us a screenshot. Thanks. I wanted to ask a about your interest in the humanities for obvious reasons. You know, I work in the writing and humanities program. We, you know, we work together uh, on occasion. And, you know, you did say before, you know, earlier in the show that you were, I think you, you did a poetry minor or a double, a double major. What was that? It was a double major. Okay. Um, so I grew up like loving writing and yeah. I grew up writing poems and like, I have like horrible poems that I wrote when I was a kid, <laughs> yeah. you know, and downstairs. Yeah. And, like, I think you have to, you, you don't poems. start off, you don't start off with wonderful poems, you know, they're, <laughs> start sometimes you don't end up with wonderful poems either, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it was something I always loved to do as a kid. And like, if I had a snow day, like my kids today, I would make magazines and like staple, you know, paper in half, oh, and creating cute. different things. And like, I just loved it. And I love being creative and I love how writing just like it it helps me sometimes just figure out what I'm thinking. And so it's just a space for me to try to figure it out. And so when I went into college, I knew, you know, I was going to be a science major. So I, I started actually in biomedical engineering and I stopped that major immediately because it wasn't for me. And so then I ended up doing neuro neuroscience, which was a super fun major. And I learned a lot and it was really interesting. And then I wanted to do creative writing and I was taking a lot of English classes because I liked it. And then Northwestern where I went has a wonderful creative writing program that you can apply into your sophomore year. They have a fiction and they have poetry. And so I was like, I want to do poetry. And so I applied on a whim and was like lucky enough to get in, got to work with people like Eula Biss and Robin Schiff who were just incredible at their disciplines. And I learned a ton. And then my, like I was, the more I like sort of realized that I was wanting to go into medical school, but also that I loved to write poetry. I was like, you know, these things are actually like related, right? Like they both rely a lot on observations and being able to read people and understand uh, what motivates people. And so I was like, I was seeing some overlap. And so my going into my senior year, there was an opportunity to get some funding for traveling and doing a travel grant and learning about things to write your senior thesis and poetry about. And I really, so the other back, the backstory on that was my summer job every summer when I was in college was working at a hospice downtown Chicago called Horizon Hospice. And this was such a cool job. I absolutely loved working at Horizon Hospice and the people I worked with there. Dr. Marshke was like one of my very first role models in medicine. And so I wanted to write poetry about death and dying. I wanted to be more involved with hospice. And so I wanted to go to the birthplace of hospice to study. And so my summer before my senior year, I got this travel grant and went to St. Christopher's Hospice in London, which was like the very first you know, oh. birthplace of hospice. And I volunteered there for about six weeks, just you know, doing whatever they needed me to do. If it was serving tea, in the tea room or helping someone like glue mosaic tiles in their art room, whatever it was I just did. And it was such a great, amazing experience and really opened my eyes to like the deeper aspects of providing care to somebody and what that really looks like and what that means. And so then I wrote my poetry thesis after that, which was such a cool experience. And then I went to medical school right after that. And so I didn't take any time off and just dove right into medical school with that as my most recent, you know, background. And I was in line for the bathroom one day in between lectures, because when I went to medical school, you had to go to lecture because (laughs) nothing was recorded. And you got this giant packet of Xeroxed note, like Xeroxed papers. You guys don't even know. But it was, this was like before computer, you know, I mean, we had computers, but like, we didn't have like our classroom site on the computer. Like you got a like a three ring binder. (laughs) That's like five inch binder. It was insane for all of your classes. (laughs) 
I'm okay that oh I missed gosh. that time period. <laughs> and you would be sitting there highlighting, and then all of a sudden you'd realize I highlighted the whole dang page. Yeah. <laughs> so, Crazy. Um, so anyway, you know, I was sitting in, in medical school lecture hall waiting for you know the next lecture to start. So I got up and went to the bathroom, which has always had a giant line, you know, because you had 10 minutes in between lectures, and all the girls got up and had to wait in line for the bathroom. <laughs> so I had my Northwestern hoodie in. And I was standing in line for the bathroom and the woman in front of me turns around and she goes, oh, did you go to Northwestern? Well, turns out this woman was Julie Eline, who's like the champion of medical humanities at MCW. So I started talking to Julie Eline in line, no idea who she is and at the time. And I said, yeah, you know, I went there for undergrad. And she's like, oh, she's like, what did you major in? And so I told her that, you know, I majored in poetry and neurobiology. She goes, poetry, you have got to join the Oscar medical journal and whatever. And so then she just like pulled me into like everything that MCW had to offer in terms of humanities, like there in the bathroom line. And it was like, <laughs> like, just like an angel sent from heaven. It yeah. was amazing. <laughs> So the bathroom line, like going to lecture, you never know who you're going to meet know. in the bathroom line. <laughs> but anyway, it was wonderful because the MCW was a wonderful place to train in terms of what they had to offer in medical humanities. And like Julie was the person to know because she knew every single offering there was. And like I still do, I don't say no to anything. So like I just got more and more involved in the humanities and it became more and more part of what I wanted to do with my career. Sure. And then I was lucky enough to get hired here and have an opportunity to do that as part of my regular job. So what does that look like for you now? Yeah, I am so lucky with my roles here. So I get to teach all of you wonderful medical students in your medicine and society course, also known kind of as the, the social justice course. So where we talk about all things related to sort of outside the biochemical realm, right, that are relevant to our health. So things in society that affect our health, which actually affects, you know, a, a good chunk of chronic diseases are actually caused by social factors rather than necessarily biochemical factors intrinsic to us. So, so I get to do that. And I think the way that I actually came about doing this course is through humanities as sort of the back door. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But when I was in residency, I wrote an opinion editorial about a patient I took care of who was dying. And I was fortunate enough to find placement of that opinion editorial in the Wall Street Journal. And so this opened for me doors of opinion editorial writing and what that looks like for doctors trying to communicate messages about healthcare to the general public. And so then I designed a curriculum in opinion editorial writing. When I came here, this was something I really wanted to do because I think that as physicians and as healthcare providers, we have a social responsibility to help make society a better place and help people understand healthcare issues in ways that we can make change, right? And so, so I designed this course and started teaching it to medical students in their third and fourth years. And it was a ton of fun and I still do it and I love it. It's the best part of my year every year. It's a four week course in February advertising. <laughs> and so sign up. But anyway, it's a great course. And yeah, I, I've I heard great things about students. it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Good. It's my favorite thing that I do, honestly, and I, I get to do a ton of fun stuff. But the students bring so many amazing, courageous ideas to the table, of things they think we can do better in medicine as a society, just as human beings. And they come with these amazing ideas. And by the end of the four week block, they have written that into an opinion editorial that's ready for publication. And I think they, I hope I'm not putting words in their mouth, but I think they generally are like super proud of their creation as they should be. And it's ready. I mean, they're ready to put something into the world that's going to make a positive change. So anyway, so I started doing that. And then when the opening for medicine and society course director opened, I thought, gosh, a lot of what the curriculum in this course looks like is what I'm trying to foster through the op-ed course. So I applied uh, for course director there and was was fortunate enough to to get the position and I absolutely love it. I think um, in our course we get to navigate all different kinds of social issues that are intrinsically part of our health that I didn't learn about when I was a medical student. Like I remember learning about the Krebs cycle and about like the development of the neural tube and all this other stuff, which is really important. I don't mean to say that it's not, but like we never had a course that talked about how we can help patients with their drug use, about what it's like to be a patient struggling with addiction, about how to take care of incarcerated patients. We never learned any of that stuff. And in medicine and society, that's what we get to do. And like, it's so cool. I just, I love taking part of, in that course and being part of the planning of that course. This year, we're adding a lecture on climate change and health. And I'm like, I never really thought about how climate change affects our health, right? And, but it absolutely does. 
so anyway, so that's part of it. And then more recently, I've gotten to take on a faculty role in the the bio, program in bioethics and humanities. And so as part of that, I get to do all different kinds of things with Dr. Calgen, with Dave, with Katie Prisky, and things like helping with the humanities distinction track, helping mentor students on that track, and helping Katie and Dave really do the bulk of the running of that track. But I, I, help, I think I help to mentor people and advertise for it. Um, and then I also help edit the Examine Life Journal as the nonfiction editor. I help to teach ethics to students that are on their sub internship. So they every four weeks, there's a you know you run these rotations that last four weeks at a time. Mm-hmm. So every four weeks, there's a new cohort of students that are on their sub internship, and they get some ethics teaching on that. So I do that teaching session. I'm gonna give a lecture on narrative ethics at the end of the month. I get to do some guest speaking. I help teach a course at Medical College of Wisconsin every year, uh, one session in the spring on the art of medicine and the humanities. I've been going back to do that ever since I graduated. Um, So I get to do all kinds of fun stuff. And I hope I answered your question without running on too much. But point being is that I guess the teaching role, I end up practicing about 35% of my time is spent seeing patients. And the rest of my time is spent teaching. So I get to teach all of you guys and then also um, do a lot of work with medical humanities um, and bioethics too, which is a really fun blend. That sounds like a lot of fun to me. <laughs> <laughs> and every day is different. Yeah. And so it's. I think uh, I'm very lucky in that way. I will say I'm so glad that you do the Mass 2 course because that is how I figured out about you and that there was a MedPeds doctor here at Iowa Um, so that like exposure helped a lot. And then I know you're talking about, you talked about finding, you know, somebody that you can look up to. And like, I feel like I look up to you a lot. So I think that's really cool. Oh boy. That's a lot of responsibility. (laughs) Oh Oh, gosh. Can you come to my party? (laughs) Oh, that's so nice. Thank you so much just for saying that. And like, I will just say that as somebody that, you know, is is a teacher of medicine, like that is why we do this is because we love, love students and we want to foster um, students into the careers that like are going to benefit them and benefit humanity and keep you happy and enjoying your job for years to come. And so like getting to hear that was inspiring is, is really very meaningful to me. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, that's our show. Dr. Brittany Bettendorf, thanks for coming on the show to talk with us today about your specialty. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great getting to hear your perspective on a lot of different things and learn more about the potential of what MedPeds can do in the future. Yes, thank Thank you you so much. And Madeline, Alex, thanks for helping out with that. Of course. Yeah, thank you. And what kind of inhuman monster would would I be if I didn't thank you, Shortcoats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available. Like uh, Apple, Spot, or, bleh, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government, an ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our music is by Dr. Fox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This short code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.